So good morning still, just. Uh, my name's Tom Quick. Uh, I'm a surgeon. You've heard from two very eminent paediatricians. I'm a surgeon. I have a paediatric practice, an adult practice. And the majority of what I do still is nerve trauma, is nerve injury. And that is very different to what we're talking about today. But some of the techniques that we've developed over the past decade in rehabilitation, in functional improvement, in uh, particularly nerve transfer, but the rehabilitation of motor learning is going to be very pertinent to rehabilitation in acute flaccid myelitis. So I want to talk a little bit, not just about the surgical intervention, but about the whole team approach to rehabilitation. Uh, I'm based at the Royal National Orthopaedic Hospital. We have a clinic here in town. The hospital actually is based just off about an hour north of here. I do have a video. This is online just to go through exactly our MDT approach. Lovely, beautiful countryside out where we are with the 1950s pre-built building. But this really emphasises the approach that we hold, that it, it cannot be a person in isolation and an expert in isolation. I really think there probably is no such thing as an expert in isolation anymore. Um, so that's available online. I'll send links to that. I must also credit the work of my colleagues here and our ongoing future research uh, with the Centre for Nerve Engineering, of which I'm one of the founding members over at UCL. And I want to start with your experiences. And we ran a community nerve injury day, and an awful lot of people with allied uh, inflammatory conditions came along. So we recruited, uh, I think it was 60 patients uh, and family members that turned up, talking about their experiences. And just from those who had inflammatory myelitis, these were the words that came out and an awful lot right down the middle here uncertainty waiting experts physios networks team worry body image anxiety neurophysiology all these new words that you worry about that you learn along that journey and this is exactly where we focused all of our research is coming at the beginning from patient experience from family experience and recognizing the questions that you have and that we need to address, because it's very easy, I was going away and thought, oh, we've got this lovely virus, we're really interested in that protein, and believe me, scientists and doctors do get very excited by things that really don't matter, we're good at that. But this is where we focus everything, you know, polio worry, all these words that strike, it's like that cancer word, there are words that just put fear into people, and there's aspects of care that really are troublesome, and this big word, the uncertainty and the waiting, right down the middle there. So in a way try and address some of that so I love Ben's wire one wire two I'm going to bring in some more wires muscles so my research my doctorate research was all about assessing motor outcomes now we're absolutely right when we look at a muscle we look at what it does we look at the efferent function that word just means messages going out from the brain to the body now in any nerve uh, system there's a feedback loop because you can't have control without information coming back. And the term for information coming back is the afferent. Okay? And this is beautifully set up within the spinal cord. You recognize this kind of slide from, uh, from Ben's talk. This is more how I like to think about it. Central nervous system things are generally things I don't touch. I leave those to the people with the suction devices. There's not much you can do inside. These things are locked away in bone for a reason. The brain is locked away in a bony box and probably shouldn't really be opened. And the same with the spine. So I deal with everything else outside of the bony boxes. Okay? So this is my view of the central nervous system. If we go into it, as we've seen, we've talked an awful lot about the ventral horn, the efferent function, the messages coming out from the brain to the body. In most of the injuries that I deal with, so that this is the uh, ventral horn and these are the information coming out, it then forms a spinal nerve. Now that spinal nerve is a mixture of information coming out and going in. And the information coming back in comes to the back, to the dorsal side, through this thing called the dorsal root ganglion, and then in. And there's a wire one, wire two thing on the coming back in as well. Okay? Everything that I've dealt with up until recently, all nerve injury, takes out information flowing both ways. The very interesting thing about what we're dealing with here is it takes out just this ventral horn. It takes out just the information to the muscle. Now that's going to have huge difference to the way that we assess it and the way that we treat it and the way that we rehabilitate it to anything else that we've done much before. And polio is a great model. 
But we didn't have MRI scans then. We didn't have the understanding of nerve transfer then. And we didn't have the epidemiologic might and computer power and associated uh, medical power that we have now. And so the lessons we could have learned from polio, we didn't. That's specific to now. So Tom, are you saying that in AFM there is no damage to the feedback? Wire? Well, the dorsal. not that there's no damage, but that the major this flaccid weakness is a turning off of the brain's control of the muscle, but there is still feedback back. We know the sensory nerves, the feeling in all these arms and legs and body parts are normal. So this is a unique model, and this is a little sketch I did for a grant, but in a normal nerve, this is the, the old sort of physics of wiring, that the ones coming out are little circles and the ones going back are crosses. So you've got wires going in and wires going out in a normal nerve, but then those affected by FM, the ones going back in, they're, they're fine, the ones coming out, they're dead. So it's very, very different, and that is the very basis upon which we need to go. So I take Ben's wire one, wire two, and I throw in a whole new feedback. And we've, this is all wire two, but in a sort of different way. But anyway, information is getting back from the muscle. And that is going to be pertinent to rehabilitation. So, how do we go ahead in understanding a brand new condition for surgical treatment? The medics are going to do all they can to try and stop it happening and decrease the effects when it has happened. But in those that are left with a, a paralyzed limb, we know the natural history in many of these kids as they get better. And in a section, they don't. So how do we select those that are not going to? And how do we know how best to treat them? Answer, I don't, we don't. So we are trying our best and being open and honest about the fact that we don't know. A number of faces I recognize around the room. In the same way the mayor culpa has come from my medical colleagues, I have the same story. We did not understand this two years ago. I was at conferences talking to colleagues. We didn't realize we were talking about the same kind of thing. So we've been in contact, we've been talking, and yet until your language comes together and you have that personal experience, it's seen as something that, oh, that's interesting, but it's not something I'm likely to see. And all oh, those lessons, well, we've got this, oh, yeah, well, that's interesting. And there's conversation start. So how are we going to assess patients? What investigations have we got to work out what's going on? And what menu of treatment options can we have and how do they come together? We've spoken about the plasmapheresis and the, uh, and the intravenous um, immunoglobulins. We have the same kind of vast amounts of different things we can do. And do we do one, do the other, and all of that. So I want to just talk a little bit about assessment, a little bit about investigations, and the way we might be changing that a bit, and then move to treatment, which maybe is what you were more expecting. So how are we setting things up at the minute? How should it work? So assessments. You cannot, in any neurologic condition, do it with a snapshot. A picture is not good enough. You need the video. Okay? You might even need the box set. But one picture at one time isn't going to tell you anything because these are changing conditions, and many kids are different. So seeing it once is no good. Seeing it twice is better. Seeing it three times, you're going to have an idea, along with information brought from tests, which we'll get through in a minute. But in that clinic environment, when you bring your two-year-old, your five-year-old, your seven-year-old, they're not normal. You're not normal. You're stressed and worried. You've traveled a long way. You meet, you meet you know, the hospital and the environment. And your child, the patient, is also not at ease and playing. And we try our best, and our therapists are an awful lot better at it than I am, but in getting those kids to just play. And so bringing family videos, having those things where you found and captured it are such great resources for us at that first interaction and the second interaction and the third and going on. An expert interaction, not just for those videos because again trick maneuvers can often happen and you can look like it's something when it's not, but having those play therapists, the, the, the physical therapists that are expert in interacting with children, I have my own kids and I still struggle to interact with them now, they're 10 and 12, it's getting harder, but learning those tricks and tips to get kids to do things for you without just bribing them with chocolate. So. Assessment is key. So that's just clinical assessment, but then the investigation. So interpreting these things, people I have found in the lay community, patients and families, expect a test to give an answer. I've had an MRI scan, what does it say? Well, it's this grainy black and white image and you know, have a look because it gives us bits of a puzzle. And you've got to then fit that with clinical examination and how things change over time. So 
it's expert. The interpretation of those is expert. And sometimes people think it comes with a printout. It comes with, this is AFM. It will get better in two months. It will get better in a year. And it never does. And we're never going to get to that point. Again, this thing of repetition, and I'll keep repeating it because it's important, but doing things again and again and things changing over time and it not just being one snapshot being helpful. And then with a number of these investigations, the implications of it being a young child. To give a child an MRI scan means knocking them out. And we know that general anaesthesia is not 100% safe. And we also know that general anaesthesia has an effect in the growing, developing brain on intellect, on personality, on all sorts of subtle things. And so we don't want to just do it for no reason, and we don't want to do it repeatedly for no reason. EMG investigations, that needle muscle test that I'm sure most of your children have had and yourselves, isn't comfortable. And it's not comfortable when I've had it done, because any test I have, I generally have climbed in an MRI scanner for research things, and I've had EMGs. I think it's important we know what it's like. It's pretty sore. It's not awful, but it's not nice. And that's in a normal muscle. But these kids have got a damaged muscle. It isn't, it, it isn't functioning in a normal way. And I don't just need an EMG of one muscle like I do in most things that I do. I need a whole load of EMGs. So can we give these kids a conscious sedation to allow them to be more compliant and enjoy, actually enjoy that interaction? And we have found intranasal ketamine to be wonderful for that multiple EMG assessment. Now, a lot of you may have heard of ketamine. It's a horse tranquilizer in the press. And it's a drug of social abuse. Um, one of my journalist friends frequently takes it and calls me up at two in the morning saying he can't feel his body. Uh, congratulations, Charlie. Um, of course, any drugs have abuse and have a backstory, but this is a wonderful dr drug that makes people... They use it in the battlefield an awful lot because it maintains the airway, it maintains consciousness, but it takes away feeling. So it's a very useful drug in kids, but... It does have the side effect in adults, particularly of it can give you rather disturbing dreams. Kids, it doesn't seem to, and we certainly don't see that reported, and it's been um, in many places taken up with great enthusiasm because it is such a powerful drug. But it allows us to do that really thorough examination without raising antibodies, in inverted commas, to going to hospital and having needles stuck in you. So then treatment. And again, there's this specificity specific to each child at different times in their development. Multimodal, we can't just do surgery. We need psychology, dietitian, physiotherapist, occupational therapist. It needs to be that whole team. And anybody who's trying to do this in isolation is not giving their patient the best. And this is what concerns me about the surgical mentality sometimes. You will always find a surgeon who's happy to do an operation. It's fun. We enjoy it. But if you're not doing it in an associated team, you are not going to gain from that procedure. So it's not nerve transfer. It is therapy of which a small part of that is nerve transfer. Multimodal, as we've said, so hydrotherapy, um, functional electrical stimulation, constant passive motion, all of these things, because we know this muscle is constantly saying, I'm at stretch, I'm loose, I'm stretched, I'm back loose. That information's coming back. So keep those limbs moving because it's firing stuff back into the spinal cord. And we know that functioning nerves around developing nerves and recovering nerves helps them recover. So nerves talk to each other even within the spinal cord. In truth, their support cells, their glial cells talk to each other. But there's a communication. Like I recently found trees communicate with each other within the forests with their roots. The same in the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. F activity of nerves helps the other nerves recover. So it also maintains joints that are nice and supple, uh, muscles that are ready to get going, and a brain that still thinks I can move this. Because kids will very quickly get a habit of just, yeah, whatever, floppy arm. And unless they have an ability to know they can control that, they're not going to relearn it. And that's where, as we've already mentioned, hydrotherapy helps, it comes back earlier, it's easier. So all of these aspects. And I'm going to speak a little bit about novel treatments, what might be coming down the line with research for treatment. What is a nerve transfer? In essence, it's taking something that's working and wiring it to something else. So if my power cable here to my computer went, and there was nothing I could do to this power cable, I could steal the power cable from the light over there. It would mean the light was a bit dimmer or goes out, but it means I can run my computer as well. And that's nerve transfer. It's robbing Peter to pay Paul. 
Now this goes on a principle that we've always had of tendon transfer, which again may well be pertinent in a number of cases. It's more reliable, the effects come quicker. But if I have a muscle that does this, I can, sorry, a muscle that does this, I can transfer it to do that function. I just cut it and move it. The brain then has to relearn, and we've spoken, Ben's mentioned cortical plasticity. So plastic just means changeable. So the nerve can, the brain can learn, well I know when I called that number, I got this movement. But now when I call that phone number, I get this movement. Oh well, I'll just refile it under, it does that movement. And kids do that amazingly quickly. Adults, it is, it takes so long and supported and come on, well done. Kids, they just seem to somehow do it. I mean, even incredibly quickly. As long as they're engaged and coordinated. Because if they've had months and months of just ignoring it, then the representation within the brain is going to drop and they're not going to have that ability to cortically reorganise. So it's just taking a nerve and the simplest one to understand and see is one that we do called an Oberlin nerve transfer. And it's just named from a guy in France, Monsieur Oberlin. So all the nerves run down the arm. And if we've got a normal hand and wrist, but we've got no elbow flexion, I can go into the wire that's taking fibres down to the muscles down here, cut it open, and it's like an internet cable full of wires. Test each of those wires and work out what each does. And there'll be four or five that bend the wrist. Now, we have massive wrist flexor muscles because in the old days, we ran around on all four limbs and we needed to catch things and things tried to catch us. So we've got really powerful running muscles with our upper limb. Now, we don't need those anymore. Wrist flexion is not much use for anything, plumbing and fixing cars, but that's about it, getting around corners. If you want a strong grip, you actually extend your wrist, not flex it. If you all try, if you grasp your hand and try and grasp when you're down here, it's much stronger there. So we can take these nerves passing, cut them, ever so slightly changing these muscles, but not for the worse, and get that nerve and have it to grow into the muscle. So we cut it and say, as a vine, I want you to grow along this trellis and flower over there. And that's all the nerve transfer is. So it's a cutting of a functioning nerve that the brain can control, getting it to grow and control a muscle, and then rehabilitating it. It's pointless doing it without. And we can do that with sensory nerves as well, but that's nothing to do with this. But it's this brain plasticity that we have to access. The wiring is easy. It's the recovery that's difficult. So redirect working nerves, that time again, that delay, that waiting, and then relearning the function. Now, in normal nerve injury, where all the nerves have gone to the muscle, the muscle gives up waiting for a nerve. I use this analogy in the old days before the mobile phones. We can all remember that. And most of the kids can't. If you were set to meet a girlfriend at the train station, she was coming in on the 12.02 and she's not on the train, you'd probably sit and wait till the 1.02 and then maybe the 2.02. But by 2.03, you've probably gone home and you're not going to wait for it any longer. And the muscle does the same. It doesn't have a mobile phone for the nerve to call and say, I'm running late. We'll meet this other station or I'll be an hour late. Don't worry. They're not there. They haven't told you they're not coming. So the muscle normally only waits for about a year. Now, in AFM, we've still got this connection. There is something still in the muscle that appears to be making it different to what we've known historically. And we are only just getting, we don't understand it, but we're seeing case reports of muscles being re-innovatable much past 17 months, 24 months, even further on. So that boyfriend has sat waiting for that girlfriend for days and days and days. Still waiting, yeah. And that's exactly. And it's because there's something there within it. And so we're relearning this. We are relearning this and we need to understand it. And we're hoping to set up some experiments to look at why. Because we don't know why it only waited for about nine months to a year. And we don't know now why this is different. But it appears from about six different cases around the world to be different. My colleagues all the way around the world, from Los Angeles to uh, South America, um, um, again, awful lot within the States, have reported nerve transfer outcomes. And their learning is, it's important that we recognize that this is different and that the delay maybe is something that's going to be different, but that every child has a different weakness. And again, there aren't those set plays that we have. It's not as easy. 
So tests now. Are we all happy? I've managed to attract no questions yet. I hope I've not stunned you all. Are we all clear about the problem, the difference, and this loop that we're moving on from just the muscle control, but the bringing back and how we bring back the muscle control? And that's all wire two. Ben's wire two. We're all doing wire two things. I do no wire one things. That's locked up in a bony cage. I don't touch it. So now tests. Neurophysiology. You've all heard neurophysiology. I've mentioned a bit about the ketamine and the, and the way that we can do that. But again, simplistically, it's a test of the wires and the muscles. It sees how they work and it needs a needle to have a look inside the muscle to see if it's turned off or on. We can get some of the images up through the skin, but it's not very specific. So we can do surface EMG. Most of it's needle EMG, and that samples a small sphere around the tip of that needle to say, are you connected or are you not? Are you going to be reconnected? What's going on? And as we've mentioned, some of these nerves are killed, the dorsal horn, but the sensory nerves are intact. And neurophysiology can help us with the diagnosis. It can say, not this is AFM, but, ooh, the muscle's unplugged, but all the sensory nerves appear fine. And that, again, helps us. Um, and that swelling that can recover over months, so we've spoken about this edema and the death, and picking out which parts of that are, are, are applicable in each kid is difficult. We don't know how much is swelling and how much is death. The MRI doesn't tell us, and neurophysiology doesn't tell us. And that re-innovation can occur over many, many years, but we're definitely sure that delay is not good, but maybe we can wait a bit longer to be sure. So our challenge is to know which of these mechanisms is responsible for which function. So it'd be edema or the, or the death, responsible for the legs. Probably if it's a high, it's going to be the edema, the, the passing um, uh, white tracts. And the grey matter is likely, when it's in the cervical spine, to be affecting cell death. And any muscle that's had its nerve cells killed, all of its nerve cells, this, this long cigar-shaped distribution that we know, again, Ben spoke about the biceps, it's, it's an easy muscle to understand. It's got this long, sort of inch-high spread of cells that can control it. If we lose 90% of those, what happens? We don't get 10% function. And I'll go on to assessing muscles in just a minute. But if all of those are gone, there is no chance of it coming back. We have to re-innovate it. That is nerve transfer. Okay, or we'll do a tendon transfer. I can take triceps to biceps, for example. And if you've got a strong arm straightening and no bending, I can just cut the tendon, bring it around, and you'll be able to bend your arm. So there's tendon transfer doesn't get enough press because it's not cool and sexy. Okay, so outcomes. So if we're going to work out what's best, we need to know how to measure what's best. And all of you have a different story. Some are mentioning pain, but pain does not seem to be the majority of this condition. It's mainly painless. Function. Lower limb function is ambulation, sport. Um, and then upper limb self-care for kids isn't huge, but getting dressed, teeth, and play. There's been aspects of can you tie your shoelace as an assessment, but if you're three, no, I can't tie my shoelace. Because I couldn't with two arms, and I certainly now can't with one, but it's not going to be specific to my recovery. And so we need to work out what's important in outcomes in different ages and in different parts of the body. Is the scoliosis important in terms of a, a, an, asse an assessment of what happens? Do you need bracing for that? Is it, you know, are you in a wheelchair? Pressure sores, nutrition, upper limb function, all of these things. How do we measure it? Because we need to get kids better overall. So it's not just the movement of the muscles. You can do an active movement scale or um, uh, we call it MRC scale, measure the strength. It doesn't mean anything because it's all about function. But also in kids particularly, kids going into school and looking different and then developing into adolescence, we're well aware that the appearance is important and will be. This will be defining for a lot of these kids in the same way we see people walking around with the effects of polio. They are stigmatised by that. And that is important also. So activity and engagement. And that's really what we need to measure. So how do we measure that? I think our plan is to engage with you as a community and say what is important. We need your influence, your, your information, your knowledge, your experience to co-develop how we're going to measure outcome. And that is our plan. And we will get to it. It's just probably two on the list after trying to get some money to pay for doing this, um, which we're still on with. But that's the plan. We cannot do this without that, and it's what's going on already in the States. But again, things are often country-specific. 
you know, can you lift a quart of milk is always the question in any American assessment. Everyone looks at you go, what is a quart of milk? Never heard of such a thing. So you always got to have those linguistic and cultural differences. You know, can you, can you pitch a baseball? Well, no, I would never have tried. Um, so we need something specific for our cohort, but learning again from our colleagues and communities elsewhere. Now, this is where I get really... We can. Well, now that we're Brexited, of course we can. It was half a litre. We hated that. Yeah. Yeah. Or, uh, and a litre of beer is always better than a pint. So this is what I did my research on. So I get pretty geeky about this. So I will try and cut it short. We've always in medicine, led by orthopaedic surgeons who generally look a bit like me and have played rugby, and it's all about the strength. And that was what muscle function has always been. From the war, it was how strong is your peak contraction. None of you use your peak force contraction ever. There's always stories of people lifting cars when, you're, when you are stressed. You can access so much more than actually you use in day-to-day -day life. And what we've done in people recovering motor is focus on the efferent, this outgoing movement, and say, what's the strongest you can do? So I did my research project and I asked the whole pile of patients that I'd done a nerve transfer to bring back movement of the biceps. Are you happy or are you not happy on this scale? And it wasn't linked to their peak force in any way. They were unbothered whether they could lift seven kilos or 10 kilos. So I bring them together and I say, okay, so if you're not all about who's the strongest, what's it about? And it was really interesting. Fatigue, co-contraction, muscles co-contracting against each, each, each other, stiffness of movement, control of movement. When you're on a train carrying a tray of drinks, Everything tightens up so you can simplify the system. Yeah? When you're learning the piano or learning how to drive or learning something new, everything simplifies. You co-contract everything else to try and make the system more simple. Proprioception, where is the limb? Unless I look at it, I don't know where it is. It could be here or there. I don't know unless I look. That's proprioception. Control, just that I want to do a function. I don't want to have to think, bend the arm, extend the shoulder, do the wrist. I want to just grab out. Grade ability, so I want to do delicate movements, but then I want to have that force and the power. And I want to have every grade in between. And ownership, this feels, I had reports, you've given me a biceps, but it's not my biceps. So they know it bends the elbow, they know the muscle that bends the elbow is called the biceps, but they don't feel like it's theirs. It can bend the elbow, but it's not natural, integrated. And this subjectivity is the afferent. It's the ownership, it's, the, it, it's those shades of grey of a muscle. And we've never looked at this, certainly in orthopaedic medicine or plastics medicine. And this is what the key is about a muscle. And this is where we get really interesting because the amount of nerves that grow into a muscle does not affect peak force above a, th a threshold. From about 20% to 100%, I can still get you very close to a peak force. But these things are things that we've never measured, and we now can. And they are probably what's related by decreased axon levels, and all the things I've been doing are the in and the out. But all of these things should be fine in AFM if we can get it moving. So we've got a really lovely understanding now between the two arms of this circuit. So these are things that I've developed from what we've done with my colleagues in UCL. We're using something called Mooney. Now, the medics have used this in um, conditions where nerves die away over time to count amount of axons going into, amount of nerve cells going into muscles. And it's a way using neurophysiology of doing what I've done with histologic, with, with bits of human tissue and bits of animal tissue, is to actually count the cells. I can't repair your child's nerve and then go, oh, just let me have a look and I'll cut it and count them and, oh, I've chopped the nerve in two, what do I do now? So we can't do that. And so this is allowing us to measure the amount of axons and when we've looked at the, the Oberlin transfer I told you about in adults after traumatic nerve injury, this nerve number count is linked to proprioception, fatigue, and satisfaction with outcome in a way that peak force wasn't. Volumetric MRI scanning. The MRI that can show you the spinal cord can show you the muscle. And we can do all sorts of clever things, not just looking at water, which is what an MRI scan generally looks at, protons, but we can look at other uh, aspects of what makes up a muscle, the myoglobin, for example. We can look at changes and rates of change of that, but also how quickly the muscle has shrunk down when it's been de and how quickly it's growing back after I've put nerves in, into it. 
And we're just starting on this journey now, but again, it seems to predict outcome before outcome occurs. So both of these things in our model, it's only 60 patients, it's not great, and it's a totally different condition. And it'll be interesting to see how these things work in AFM, but these are telling us information ahead of time. And I think that's really helpful for this big concept we had of waiting and uncertainty. Yeah? So what do we think the future is of nerve surgery? We're definitely developing drugs. If you had a heart attack in the 1950s, the doctor would say, ah, you've had a heart attack, spend two weeks in bed, and we'll tell you how bad it was. There's nothing we can do to make it better or worse. And that's what we do with nerve injury, generally, is we say, the nerves have died, well, we'll keep looking at it, and we'll tell you in two years how bad it was. But there is no drug that we can give to change that. We may be able to, you know, perhaps antivirals aren't going to be an answer, but maybe steroids are and all these other things. We can change the course of the condition, but in terms of the actual nerves that are injured, we can't assess how bad or what's going to happen, and we cannot improve upon that. But there are a number of chemicals that we have shown in animal models are going to be useful, and these will start to come to market. And there are a number of things that are going to be very simple for us to do to do that. We're struggling to get these clinical trials up and running, but we do certainly have drugs that will help the growth, the regeneration. And just this greater understanding of this condition, of other conditions, listening to patients, which again is relatively novel in the history of medicine, and taking those stories to get a greater understanding. Um, and that's that. I was going to also play a video from my colleagues at UCL detailing all we're doing for nerve injury, but you can look them up online as well. Um, I just want to show you one video, if I may, which I hope I've got here, which shows what is possible with a nerve transfer, and I hope it's here somewhere. Um, I didn't want to show you any horrible, gory pictures, but this is with consent, uh, the armpit of a small child with the nipple here, the arm going, the head up there. And this is going into all the tiny nerves. These aren't nerves. These are little silastic bits of rubber that we use. The nerves, these tiny things here. And this is our diagram of exactly which nerve transfers we've undertaken. And hopefully just here, he said, did I do it? Uh, I hope I've got a video of a patient who we did some nerve transfers on just to show you what's possible. Maybe I don't have it. Are there any questions while I'm just poking around on my desktop? Yeah. The drugs that you mentioned, are any of those going to be focused on um, sort of rebuilding myelin around the nerves? Or you... So, yeah, so I've taken a very simplistic route of it's the wires, but you're absolutely right. Myelination, and this is the big joy that I have, is the I spoke of glial cells before. Inside the bony box, there are specific glial cells that stop nerves from growing. That's why spinal cord injury is such a problem. In a, in, in, in a way, it's the way the tract changes in AF. In, um, myelitis are a problem. The glial cells within the CNS stop nerves from growing. That's why I don't deal with the bony box. It's there, it's closed. The cells try and fight you. Outside that, the Schwann cell, which is our glial cell of the PNS, of the peripheral nervous system, encourages growth. Now that myelinates in some nerves and doesn't myelinate in others. Not all nerves are myelinated, most aren't. But it allows us to manipulate things better. So yes, when you're born as a child, you have very low levels of myelination, and that's why kids are all quite jerky and malcoordinated, as well as brain development is part of that, and that comes with age. So there's an awful lot. Kids are primed to recover not just the nerves, but the insulation as well. And yes, it's the Schwann cell that's the key to nerve regeneration, and that's the main cell line that we're working on in, in our lab. So, sorry, that question. Is, is there anything about stem cell research that might help with that? Um, so, in our nerve patient engagement day, that was the number one question. Stem cells, we've heard about it. Why, why are we not getting stem cells? The answer, it would be interesting to hear from my paediatric colleagues, the answer very simply from our point of view is it's just not there yet. We understand so little about how we drive cells in different directions in a test tube or a petri dish to then place it in a complex environment of a body, it, cells need all sorts of things around them. You can't just put a cell in, it needs matrix, it needs coordination, it needs support, it needs other cells, and it isn't as simple as we thought. So there, you, you, you can pay, if you want stem cells, you'll pay hundreds of thousands of pounds, you can go to China, someone will inject your own stem cells into you. At the best, it will do nothing. At the worst, it will make you very, very ill. And we've had people with all sorts of poor outcomes. Interested stem cell, Pediatric applications. 
Um, so first, <clears throat> as a caveat, and I should have said this at the beginning, my, my disclosure, I'm not a pediatrician. Uh, so uh, I was actually an adult certified in neurology, and years ago when I started doing TM, started seeing kids, seeing both at rare clinic, and then over the last 15 years, I split my time, I see both adults and kids. Uh, so I never like to misrepresent uh, uh, that part. In terms of the stem cells, um, three, uh, three things. So, so uh, I agree that what's offered uh, around the world is uh, uh, usually not helpful, can be harmful, and there are a variety of reasons for it. We do, we will be doing a phase one uh, first in human stem cell trial for transverse myelitis this year. The first enrolled patient will happen in the next couple months. And, and to the point about cell control, part of the safety issue, there's two issues. One is making the cells do what you want them to do. And uh, the, the definition of a stem cell is by, it can turn into anything. It can turn into a neuron, it can turn into muscle, it can turn into a tooth. You don't want a tooth in your spinal cord. Uh, that's not so helpful. So a lot of the science of the last 50 years has been figuring out, once we derive the cells, how do we make sure they only do what you want them to do? And that's what's been most of the research. So we have that part down for cells within the wire number one, that bony box, to recreate myelin. So for transverse myelitis, not AFM, this is going to be helpful, and we'll do the first transplant in probably the next 12 weeks. Um, and we'll be taking people, adults, to the operating room and directly surgically putting the cells into the spinal cord. And that's going to be about nine or ten? Nine patients nine. Uh, over a series of injections over the year for a safety study to see if this uh, works and is safe. And uh, you notice I mentioned going to the operating room and doing a direct injection. The reason is when we infuse stem cells, and this experiment has been done, into a bloodstream, 99% of those cells are cleared by the liver and the lung, and they never so when you hear about people having stem cells infusions, uh, they are degrading those cells in other organs of the body. It's very hard to get the cells specifically to the site where you want it to be. Now, 20 years ago, we had done work on wire number two stem cells. So we had a model with a uh, paralyzed rat, couldn't move its leg uh, because we had injured wire number two. And we transplanted a motor neuron into the spinal cord of the rat and the motor neuron would not grow out of the cord. It wouldn't go to the muscle. Over about two and a half years, sorted out that you had to expose the rat to certain medications, and then the wire grew out. But it just kind of hung out there. So then we added a vector to the muscle to express a growth factor, and then the, the wire grew straight to that muscle, connected to it, and the rats walked. And uh, beautiful, I can show you beautiful videos of rats who are paralyzed walking. When we submitted it for funding, the response we got was, this is great, but there's no disease that needs this. Polio is cured. Oh, so the entire project was shelved 15 years ago uh, because there wasn't a reason for it. The biggest downside of that, and, and you reference it, is two issues. One, once the cell is in, getting it to grow to the target where you want it to grow is not a trivial issue. It needs scaffolding. And so we play with all sorts of things in the lab to try and get it to grow. Secondly, uh, which you can do, but secondly is it takes a long time. And so that year, possibly, of muscle atrophy, which happens in weeks, not years, the atrophy is after wire number two gets injured, I'm sure you've witnessed in your kids, the atrophy of limb is very fast. The muscle mass uh, is lost very quickly. It's like overnight the muscle mass is lost. One of the things we're worried about is once the cell reconnects, is there enough muscle there, functional muscle there, to get as big a response as you want to justify the surgery. So we started the early work with colleagues in Atlanta who had a very cool solution to this. And we have not done this in an animal yet. It's, it's work they're trying um, in the very early stages. But they've engineered a uh, motor neuron. It's a long story but in a way where we could control, without it being connected to the brain, it turning on or off. And the idea is just to implant it in the skin, at the muscle that's been denervated, and when we want to, just turn it on and off so you just get muscle contractions, just to keep the muscle healthy. 
while waiting to then reconnect. Uh, kind of like FES, but yeah. more, but not functional. It's literally we, to keep the muscle in Keep the muscle healthy so that there's something to connect to. Um, and so that would be a, quote, stem cell. Uh, so we, so we exact, exactly the same, strangely. Um, so an, uh, what's called an optogenetically controlled device. So a light box using the same technologies. Yeah. Stem cells, motor neuron stem cells here. You put it next to the muscle. It grow, we know we can get it there. We get it there, and then you Bluetooth or whatever, and you control. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. same. It's it's a, you're talking to the other folks. It's an interesting. So, so one of the theories is once you put this in, you can just back track to the spinal cord, and then instead of having to take over a year or two years to grow out the half meter that you would need yeah, of a wire, yeah. you could surgically you could yeah. surgically just reconnect all the pieces with it. And so there's a variety of ways to go. What's missing is, which is what we all want, is let me go get an infusion of a ma of these magic stem cells, and they are magic, and have them know exactly where to go and do what it is. The central nervous system, we have tried to get stem cells into the central nervous system through peripheral infusions, and I've, I've done this in small animals and large animals, and they don't go there spontaneously. They too know it's locked in the bony box for a reason. It is. Yeah. Yeah, it's not that, yeah, well, yeah. Um, with other organs, what's frustrating about this is other organs, infusions of stem cells may be helpful. So there are heart conditions, liver conditions, where infusion of stem cells may uh, uh, help because it gets to the organ easily, uh, but not so true in the central nervous system. So definitely a word for the future, but almost certainly not. Clinically eff efficacious, we're still at trials of safety. But yeah, there's things going on, but it won't help you out.